All right, I'm going to try to speak pretty fast this morning, so stay with me. We're going to continue my series on Christian cults. So last week I preached on uh, Mormonism. This week we're going to be covering the cult of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, um, the reason, and the per, you know, I'm, I'll probably say this with every single sermon because I want to make sure we understand the, the reason why I'm preaching this is not to say, wow, look at how weird and stupid these people are and we're so smart and we know better than them and just, and just to have this type of an attitude because that's not going to do any good. Now, I may, you know, poke a little bit of fun at some of their beliefs and teachings along the way as we go through this, but that's not the goal is just to just put them down because honestly, we care about the people who are sucked into this false religion. We care about them. We want them to be saved. Now, those at the top, the false prophets that, that, that you know, have led people astray and that are the ones who are actually wicked, evil people that are, that are out to try to, you know, destroy. We've got no sympathy for those people, but that's not who the sermon's geared at really anyways. It's just to point out and to show the errors within the, the religion and one, to be able to equip you to be able to go out and provide some information to people who might be sucked into this to try to get them to think, to try to get them to, to analyze or reinterpret what they're being told and to question what they're being taught. And if you have just an, a little bit of information can go a long way and, and be able to provoke them into looking something up on their own. Now, with Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, this is going to be a very difficult task to do because they're told they have this mentality of an us versus them that basically they have the only true religion and anything outside of Jehovah's Witnesses is of Satan. Every single thing else. So anything that you're going to try to say to them, they're already having an attitude, well, this is of the devil. So it's hard to break through that. Now, as with any other cult or any other unsaved person, the strategy is going to remain the same as far as giving somebody the gospel first and foremost. This is always going to be our tactic is to try to get somebody to at least listen to the plan of salvation as dictated by God's word because God's word ultimately is where all of the power is going to reside. And if anything's going to pierce through the dividing of the soul and spirit, it's going to be the word of God. So that is the, the, the main, you know, we don't have to learn everything about every false religion in the world in order to reach all of these various people. What we need to do is make sure we know the gospel really well and preach the gospel to people. However, there is value in being able to also to prevent, present some other information in addition to the gospel you never know what might stick with somebody or might have some type of an impact with a person. Obviously, the gospel is first and foremost. That is the most power we're going with that. But if you can show people that, hey, you know, do, do you even realize anything about the history of this movement before you got sucked in because someone came to your door and just wanted to offer a Bible study with you and you love God and you're a Christian and you like the Bible. So you said, sure, because why not? Let's talk about the Bible. I mean, that's how most people get sucked into this cult to begin with is because they have questions or they, you know, oh, wow, you're offering to come into my house and hold a Bible study. Sure. And the Bible study becomes an indoctrination study. It's, it's not a study at all. It's just telling you this is what the Bible says based on the Watchtower literature. So the Jehovah's Witnesses right now are, have an organization. It's the, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society that's located in New York. I believe it's still located in New York. Uh, I don't know if they moved or not from there, but that's where their hub was for a real long time if it's not still there right now. And um, they publish all these publications and they have, they're of the belief that what the watchtower puts out is directly coming from God, that that is like the word of God. It's, it's, it's practically like it's scripture. And the Jehovah's Witness organization started off with one man. His name was Charles Taze Russell. And um, this was back in the 1800s, which it's kind of amazing. Just that time period, Brother Robert and I were talking about this last week, how it's like, 
you know, this time period alone just spawned so many cults. Just right, you know, I don't know what it was about this time period, but you have Joseph Smith, you had the Seventh-day Adventists, you, know, you had the, the Charles Taze Russell, you know, forming what became known as Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and, and all these various cults were forming, and men claiming to have these extra revelations from angels or from God, or, you know, see, you know I think they referred to it as the light, like they saw these, these revelations of light that they were receiving. And um, Charles Taze Russell... What prompted him, and I'm going to teach on this actually tonight, and hopefully I could get through this. Like I said, I'm going to try to be quick with this, but there's a lot of material to cover. I may have to split this sermon in half and not preach uh, the sermon I prepared for tonight because I have so many notes here. But um, one of the things that, uh, that I, and I, I forgot to put the actual quote in here. I read the quote, and I didn't copy it and put it into my notes but one of the things that Charles Taze Russell is quoted as saying is essentially, I'm going to paraphrase it, to accept the truth no matter where you find it. Now, on the surface, that sounds great, but then he goes on to even clarify that he says, even if it's coming from Satan, that truth is truth, and you just accept it from wherever it comes from. Now, the problem with saying something like that is because the Bible says that, that in him is no light. It's, you know, it's all darkness, that, that he's a li liar and a father of it, and that he cannot tell the truth, that Satan is a liar and he does not tell the truth at all. So you can't make a statement of saying, oh, well, even if it's coming from Satan, well, Satan doesn't tell the truth. Satan is a liar. Satan is the adversary. You know, we don't look to. And the reason why he says things like that is because Charles Taze Russell actually had a lot of influence from the occult. And he had a lot of other influences other than just the Bible. And you could find that even in their symbolism and the things that they use. You look at their old publications, their old writings, and you can see a lot of occult symbolism mixed into, and just uh, occult thinking. Occult thinking is just like that. Well, just truth wherever you find it. And occult is supposed to be hidden knowledge and things that are secrets and they're always revealing all this secret truth. And that's why these occults become appealing because they are claiming to have some extra hidden knowledge that you can never know unless we present it to you and we show you this is you know now you know something that no one else knows now you're part of this exclusive group of people that we know the bible and that you often find that jehovah's witnesses will have a pompous or an arrogant attitude because they feel like they know the Bible so much better than everybody else and you don't know you know, let me show you what the bible really says and that's the attitude that they have. And they get away with it because, unfortunately, a lot of people who claim to be Christian don't know the Bible at all because they haven't even read the Bible cover to cover even one time. So it's easy for someone else to come in that has read a Bible for, you know, even one time and just come in with authority and just, just try to tell you that, no, no, this, you're misunderstanding all of this because you don't know because you haven't read. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time in the history. Charles Taze Russell is a man who kind of founded this cult, but they weren't known as Jehovah's Witnesses then. And again, I didn't put this in my notes, but it was because I don't want to focus too much on this. It was, it was a Bible student society or international Bible student, something like that. that. That's what they kind of called themselves, that they were just Bible students and that that's the way that they wanted to be portrayed because they hadn't really formed a denomination or to get that big of a following yet. Charles Taze Russell... Um, was influenced by a man named Barber he was hooked up with, who was a, uh, um, what kind of Adventist? He was an Adventist, like a second Adventist was the, the name of the, the religion that he was in. And um, one of the things that, that, that got Charles Taze Russell associated with this man, because Charles Taze Russell was brought up a Presbyterian, but he rejected the notion of hell being eternal torment and you know the way that we that any person would commonly that hears the word hell is going to think of being a, a, a place in the center of the earth where, where people go that that pay for their sins eternally um, he didn't like that concept and i'm going to be preaching on that specifically tonight if i get through all this sermon this morning because that deserves its own sermon in and of itself it's a very important doctrine to understand so i'm going to be going that tonight but he didn't like that so he rejected that. He didn't, he didn't like that teaching, and he found another man that actually taught the same way that, that he liked, that, oh, yeah, this isn't really a place of eternal, eternal punishment. And they believe in annihilation, so that when people who are talked about in the Bible as, like, going to hell, they believe that they're just 
just wiped out. They cease to exist 100% completely, just go back into nothingness. That's what they believe, and it's a false doctrine. But um, after Charles Taze Russell, you know, he got this group established. He seemed to have all these prophecies and revelations. Um, the man that, after he died, the man that took over, his name was Rutherford, Judge Rutherford. And he actually really changed the religion quite a bit. He made a lot of uh, um, adaptations or changes to what Russell taught. And now, even today, what Jehovah's Witnesses believe uh, is removed from what both of those men taught. So it's kind of morphed and changed. As you, and you know what? It's continuing to change. So if I say anything this morning, because someone will be watching this video when it gets put up online, oh no, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that. Yeah, you might not believe it anymore, but you know what? They did at one time. Everything that I'm going to be saying to this morning was believed at one time for sure. But their religion has changed more than just about any, I mean, them and the, the, the Latter-day Satan, you know, the, the Mormons, they both have a lot of changes just, and what's, what, it's not that there's changes, but it's that they're claiming it's God, they, God said this, and they'll be like, unequivocally, this is what God said, and then within years, oh no, that's not, that's not actually true, this, you know, it's this. And they don't ever want to admit they were wrong about anything, so they just kind of, hide things away. Now, I have, there's a, a good Wikipedia page, and if you want the resources, check it out later if you're interested in this material at all. And I literally copied and pasted from this. It's sourced. I started checking the sources on the information here because Wikipedia is not always the best place for information. Let's face it. Um, anyone's allowed to submit to that. But there are many places, you know, many times, probably more often than not, it actually is uh, uh, relatively accurate and, and has a lot of sources there. So when I, when I looked at this, you can go to the same place and the Wikipedia page was Criticisms of Jehovah's Witnesses. That was the, that's the page that I'm giving this to you. Now I'm going to try to read through this really quick, but just to give you an example of the predictions that were made by this organization that didn't come to pass. And we, I referenced this verse last week, but in Deuteronomy 18, verse number 20, the Bible says, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. Remember, they're claiming to speak in the name of Jehovah. Jehovah God. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. If thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. This is how you identify a false prophet, by using that criteria as set forth in God's word. So these people are claiming to be prophets. Charles Taze Russell claimed to be a prophet. Uh, Judge Rutherford claimed to be a prophet. These were the founders of this religion that people are following even today that started this religion. And I'm going to re really quickly read down this list, and this isn't even comprehensive. But there's a lot of stuff on here that they were claiming, and it has the actual dates because... They printed this stuff in their Watchtower organization literature. They made books. One of them was, and it's probably in this list, but one of them, they, they made this book that was, Many Living Today Will Never Die. And that was back in the early 1900s. It came out in like 1915 or something. It'll be in here. I'll get you the exact date. And their whole prophecy was that because Jesus Christ was going to come back and Armageddon was going to happen and that the end times were going to happen there's going to be some people that aren't going to see death. And they got that quote from Matthew 24 is what they were referring to, where um, Jesus said that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. So they're saying, see, the event started happening already. So this generation, back in 1914 or 19, yeah, I think 1914, 1915, somewhere in, in one of those years, they said, yep, this generation isn't going to pass until everything's fulfilled in the Bible. Well, I don't know what your definition of a generation is, but it's 2017 and it's been over 100 years since that prophecy took place. I think that generation is pretty much past. You're going to be hard-pressed to find people that were even born during that time. I mean, there are a few out there, I know, but um, in any case, that's one. And, and see, that is the way that they started was using this impending doom 
And that's one of the reasons why they're a cult. They were just, you know, they're trying to suck people in. Oh man, you know, the end of the world is near and you need to, you need to, to join us because if you are not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, then you're going to be annihilated. And it's bad for you. Now, what they do is they take a truth. You say, well, wait a minute, that sounds kind of similar to, well, you need to be saved or else you're going to go to hell. Well, it is similar. But they've tweaked it to, to really manipulate and control people because the way that they say a person is saved is not the same way the Bible says a person is saved. They believe you have to work for it. They believe you have to be, you know, join their, their organization and, and do all these various things and go out and, and witness to people and do all these things in order to be saved. And it's a complete and total works-based salvation. And they won't even deny that. See, a lot of people that we go out and preach the gospel to, they'll deny that they believe in a works-based salvation. Jehovah's Witnesses won't deny that. They embrace it. They believe, nope, you have to do the work. I mean, Mormons will even try to deny that it's a works-based salvation. Even though they say faith without works is dead and you have to have the works, they, they still will deny that, that concept, but the Jehovah's Witnesses won't. So I'm going to read through this list really quickly, and I'll probably just not read the whole thing. But um, in 1877, this was a publication, Christ, here's what they said, Christ's kingdom would hold full sway over the earth in 1914, the Jews as a people would be restored to God's favor. The saints would be carried to heaven. That was their prediction in 1877 that that was going to happen in 1914. 1891, the prediction was 1914 would be the farthest limit of the rule of imperfect men. I mean, this was unequivocal. This is, this is I, God told me. The word of the Lord came to me and God says that not, it's not going past 1914. Will not happen. This is Charles Taze Russell. 1904, they said worldwide anarchy would follow the end of the Gentile times in 1914. They claim worldwide anarchy. In 1916, so now 1914 is passed, right? None of these things came to pass. 1916, World War I would terminate in Armageddon and the rapture of the saints. So World War I was going on at this time. And they said, World War I is going to end by Armageddon happening and the rapture. Well, we know that that didn't happen either. 1917, they predicted this, that in 1918, Christendom would go down as a system to oblivion and be succeeded by revolutionary governments. God would destroy the churches wholesale and the church members by the millions. Church members would perish by the sword of war, revolution, and anarchy. The dead would lie unburied. In 1920, all earthly governments would disappear with worldwide anarchy prevailing. So this was their prediction in 1917. Sounds very similar to the ones that they predicted before 1914 that didn't come to pass. So then in 1920, because they predicted by 1920 all the earth's governments would disappear, right? They have another prediction. They said Messiah's kingdom would be established in 1925. You like how they keep kicking the can down the road and bring worldwide peace. God would begin restoring the earth. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful patriarchs would be resurrected to perfect human life and be made princes and rulers, the visible representatives of the new order on earth. Those who showed themselves obedient to God would never die. And this was during um, Rutherford's reign as the cult leader. And he actually made, and I, this may not be in here, he actually made uh, like a mansion in California for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to dwell in when they came back to this earth. He said, well, we need to have this place built and it's got to be honorable because these prophets are coming back and they're going to be living on this earth. So we need to build this place. So he built the place and guess who stayed in that house? Rutherford did. A really nice, fancy mansion, pools, you know, I mean, lavish place. Oh yeah, yeah, we're doing it all. See how he suck people in? We're doing it all for these great, I mean, how can we not have a nice place for these great prophets to come back in? And then it's, well, someone needs to stay here and keep up the house until they get here, right? So, so I'll take that burden on myself and, and stay in that place for you. So, you know, unfortunately though, and we're barely even scratching the surface on this. Unfortunately, most, I would probably say that most people today that are practicing Jehovah's Witnesses are completely ignorant to this. Probably completely ignorant to it. 
Now, some of them may know a little bit about it, but they, you know, they'll, they'll whitewash these things and downplay them or come up with any type of an excuse to explain it away. And at the end of the day, there's some people that the truth will not matter to. They want to hear a lie. And the Bible tells us about people like that, that they have itching ears and they want to hear a certain thing. You might think, well, who would want to hear this? There's some people that do. They they're not really interested in the truth. They're just, they just feel comfortable being told what's right and wrong and that you know, they've been involved in this or their family's involved in this, so they want to stay a part of that. And also, the disfellowshipping that goes on in the uh, Jehovah's Witness cult is so serious that um, you know, they, they prohibit you from even speaking to other family members. I mean, they completely want to isolate you from anybody else that might have any differing opinions from the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and it's really, see, there's a lot of testimonies of people you could see on the internet of what they went through and how even to this day, people's own children or their own parents and stuff just will have nothing to do with them, literally because they left the organization. Not because they're living in some extreme wickedness, not because they're off, you know, living some horrible life, but literally because they left the organization. That's it. That is a true sign of a cult also. Look, if anyone left this church, <laughs> our standard here, our teaching here is not that you could never talk to that person again. Okay? Especially, oh, they went to another church. <gasps> okay? <laughs> I, I, ho I hope that, that, you know, that church is the right church for you then because, uh, you know, that's, that's the attitude that we have here. It's not that we are the only ones that have the truth and that you can't learn anything from anywhere else except unless you're right here. No, that's cultish. Now, uh, I'm going to read through a few more of these and then get on. There's way too much information here. 1922, the antitypical jubilee that would mark God's intervention in earthly affairs would take place probably the fall of 1925. That was their prediction in 1922. In 1924, they predicted God's restoration of earth would begin shortly after October 1st, 1925. Jerusalem would be made the world's capital. Resurrected princes such as Abel, Noah, Moses, and John the Baptist would give instructions to their subjects around the world by radio and airplanes would transport people to and from Jerusalem from all parts of the globe in just a few hours. That was a prediction in 1924, that it would happen shortly after October 1st, 1925. 1938, now this is all past already again. Armageddon was too close for marriage or childbearing. This is what they instructed the people in 1938. Don't get married and don't have children because the end of the world is just way too close. So just don't even bother with that. You don't have time for that. You don't need to get mixed up in having children. That reminds me of, you know, in the Bible, false prophets forbidding to marry. Right? Forbidding to eat meats. Well, this is another thing that they did. And it wasn't until, and this probably isn't in here either, but, I, but when I was researching, I spent a lot of time researching this to make sure I have all my facts straight. The, uh, the, the, either one of the member boards or, the, or whoever was in charge at the time, they decided to get married. <laughs> After this was already stated, hey, Armageddon's too close, don't get married and don't have children. And then the leader gets married. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that's changed now. 1941, they predicted there were only months remaining until Armageddon. 1942, Armageddon was immediately before us. So you see, I mean, they just keep using this urgency. And look, this is, it started with the predictions in 1877. Now it's 1942. And the imminency and the threat is still right there. 1961, Awake magazine stated that Armageddon will come in the 20th century. This generation will see its fulfillment. That was in 1961. 1966, it would be 6,000 years since man's creation in the fall of 1975, and it would be appropriate for Christ's thousand-year reign to begin at that time. Talking about 1975. Time was running out. No question about that. The immediate future was certain to be filled with climactic events. Within a few years at most, the final parts of Bible prophecy relating to the last days would undergo fulfillment as Christ's reign began. In 1967, the end time period, beginning in 1914, was claimed to be so far advanced that the time remaining could be compared 
not just to the last day of a week, but rather to the last part of that day. So they're saying that they still want to hold to these 1914 prophecies because they don't want people to think that, oh, that was false. But they, so they manipulate and change it and say, oh, well, see, that's when it all started. But then in 1967, they're saying this is like literally like right at the end, not just the last day of the week, but the last hours of that last day of the week. I mean, we are in this time period now in 1966, 1967. Oh, wait, that was 1967. 1968, no one could say with certainty that the Battle of Armageddon would begin in 1975, but time was running out rapidly with earth shaking events. So they're kind of backtrack already even in 1968. In March 1968, there was a short period of time left with only about 90 months left before 6,000 years of man's existence on earth is completed. 1969, the existing world order would not last long enough for young people to grow old. The world system would end in a few years. Young witnesses were told not to bother pursuing tertiary education for this reason. So not only were they told before not to marry, now they're just saying don't even get educated, don't even go to school, don't do anything because the end is near. 1971, the battle in the day of Jehovah was described as beginning shortly within our 20th century. 1974, right, right before 1975, which is when all this stuff was supposed to happen, there was just a short time remaining before the wicked world's end and witnesses were commended for selling their homes and property to finish out the rest of their days in this old system in the pioneer service. Well, guess what? 1975 came and passed. And actually, when this came and passed, Jehovah's Witness organization lost multitudes of followers. And it makes sense because that's when they had, this was kind of at their peak was in the 1970s. I mean, they were, they were still kind of up and coming in the early 1900s and they were gaining more traction, getting more followers. But then by the time, you know, the early 1970s, man, they were in full force, full steam ahead, deceiving people left and right. 1975 comes and goes and they lost a lot of membership. And for good reason, thank God that some people were smart enough to say, hey, I've been duped. These things aren't happening. They're not coming to pass like you said they would. You're a liar because God's not speaking by you. 1984, there were many indications that the end was closer than the end of the 20th century. And then in 1989, the Watchtower asserted that Christian missionary work begun in the first century would be completed in our 20th century when the magazine was republished then later in bound volumes, the phrase in our 20th century was replaced with the less specific in our day. So that they go back and they, and they, they change these things. They, they um, you know, republish them and go back and try to, to change what's already been, you know, this is the word of God. Now, the Watchtower literally is, if you're familiar with the novel 1984 by George Orwell, the Watchtower is the religion of 1984 because the Watchtower organization is like the ministry of truth. I mean, they literally like want to know what you're doing. You have to report into them with, you know, we do our soul winning times where we go out and preach the gospel to people. and We have the time set up in the bulletin, you know, but it's up to you if you're going to participate in that or not. Totally voluntary, right? Completely. You, just, you do it, you don't do it, whatever. Kind of like giving money. You do it, you don't do it, whatever, right? We have our beliefs on all this stuff, but it's just, there's no repercussions. There's nothing that's going to come against you, you know, from, from the church if you don't do these things. Jehovah's Witnesses are required to submit how many hours they put in their field. It's their field work they put in. And in order for you to remain in good standing within the church, you have to be submitting these things and have a certain level of hours of field work done all the time. So they, they want to keep tabs and monitor people in that regard. And not only do they want to, you know, kind of control what you're doing, they also will then send their false predictions like the ones we all just, we just read about down their memory hole and just deny their existence and deny they never ever even happened and just downplay it and say like, oh, this isn't a big deal or, oh, they meant something else. Oh, there was a little bit of confusion about that. No, they claim to be the word of God and it wasn't because it didn't happen. Um, Another quote here again from the, the page, according to Pref Professor Edmund Gruss, other failed predictions were ignored and replaced with new predictions. For example, in the book, The Finished Mystery, which came out in 1917, events were applied to the years 1918 to 1925 that earlier had been held to occur prior to 1914. So all these predictions that came out that were, that were made prior to 1914, well, then they published this new book in 1917 saying, oh, oh, 
These same exact predictions are going towards 1918, 1925. When the new interpretations also did not transpire, the 1926 edition of the book changed the statements and removed the dates. This is their memory hole. That's what they just, they just take the book back. Oh, nope, we're going to change this now and then republish it. New edition doesn't have this stuff anymore. And just try to erase it from ever happening. Um, you know, I've got a whole list. I'm not going to read through this stuff because other things are more important. I want to get to the doctrine. <laughs> I've got pages, literally, of changes to watchtower prophecies and doctrine. I'll read this one opening paragraph to you. And if you're interested in this, I'll give this to you. You could have this after the service. I could print more of these things off. But this is all available on the Wikipedia page. Um, here is the, uh, this, this opening paragraph. But it says, although Watchtower Society literature claims the society's founder, Charles Taze Russell, was directed by God's Holy Spirit, through which he received flashes of light, it has substantially altered doctrines since its inception and abandoned many of Russell's teachings. Many of the changes have involved Bible, biblical chronology that had earlier been claimed as beyond question. When he made them, it was just unquestionable, undeniable truth. But of course, they didn't come to pass, so they go back and change it. Watchtower Society publications state that doctrinal changes result from a process of progressive revelation in which God gradually reveals his will. And then, it go, I'm not going to read these. It would, it, would, it would just take too long. All of the, the various changes to their doctrines are here. But I want to get into some of their doctrines that they teach that are false doctrines and get more into the Bible. We started reading in Genesis chapter 2, and I kind of picked ones that are extremely important and critical uh, doctrines. One involving, I believe, you know, trying to help these people get saved. These are important doctrines to understand that they hold to so that when you use a word, oftentimes they have a different meaning or understanding of what that word even means. And one example of that is just the word saved. So they don't believe that they only, and I'm going to get into this later, but they only believe 144,000 people are going to go to heaven. So when we go out and preach the gospel to people, one of the things we like to say is, hey, if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Because the vast majority of Christians will, you know, accept the concept of going to heaven when you die. And it's a good opening statement. But prior to that, we usually ask people, hey, when I invite you to church, do you go to church anywhere? And if they say, well, I go to a kingdom hall, because that's the name of their church where they go to worship Jehovah's Witnesses, I do not ask if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Because what that's going to lead into is an argument or debate about whether or not you even go to heaven. And at that moment, that is not the critical thing I want to get to. I want to get to the gospel before talking about who gets to go to heaven or who stays on this earth because they believe that the vast majority of people who are saved are just going to be on this earth. So I, we need to get to that, you know, as I gave them the gospel, but that's not the first thing I want to focus on. So I just say, well, do you know for sure you're saved? And that's just a good tip. If you, if you run into someone's job, it's just ask them if they know for sure they're saved if you want to get into the gospel with them and say, well, how do you know that? Because then they're going to have to rely on some types of works as to why they're saved. And then you can show them from Scripture that it's not of works and, and really get into that from the Bible and, and hopefully just be able to at least show them that because that is critical. Um, another area, though, where you might, if you're having a conversation with them, on where they believe different is a soul. And what is a soul? So we started off in Genesis 2. If you want to look at Genesis 2, verse number 7, when God made Adam... The Bible says in verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So they take that statement and say that, you know, we understand the concept of we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And the soul and the spirit reside within our body, but it's not our body. They're separate things. They don't believe that. They basically believe that your body essentially is the soul. Now, their teaching is inconsistent on it because they change what soul means on, the con on whatever context it's given in. They don't have an actual definition for a soul because they, they use it in different ways, and I'll, and I'll show you the examples of that. Um, we believe a soul is separate. So 
If you want to turn to Genesis 35, verse 18, just to, to prove a little bit as to why we believe a soul actually exists that is separate from the body. The way that God gave man the soul was by breathing into him, as we saw in Genesis chapter 2. But we don't need to be worried about the terminology man became a living soul because the flesh isn't where your life really resides and kind of who you are, but the flesh in, is an important aspect of us as being a human being, being a person, right? Um, it, it's part of who we are, but what's more important is what's on the inside, like the soul or the spirit. Um, Genesis 35, verse 18, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin, and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So this is, you know, Rachel gives birth to Benjamin, she dies, and it says, as her soul was in departing. So her soul was leaving, but where was her body? Was her body leaving too? No, her body stayed right there, but the Bible says, as her soul was in departing, for she died, in parentheses, she, she, she died. That's why her soul was leaving. So her soul left her body, and her body died. Pretty simple concept. You know, they think it's a weird thing. Oh, what, you think we have something else besides this? Yeah, we do, because how could you even make sense of this if you think that the, the body is the soul? It, it makes no sense. Your soul is leaving. Leaving where? Leaving the body. They're two separate things. Uh, I'll read this for you in 1 Kings 17. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. I'll read this for you in 1 Kings 17. One of the miracles of Elijah, we went through this in our 1 Kings Bible study, when Elijah brought that child back to life. 1 Kings 17. You're turning to Psalm 16. Psalms right near the middle of your Bible. Psalms chapter 16. 1 Kings 17, 21 says, And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. We saw the soul departing when someone died, and now Elijah's asking, Hey God, can you bring this child's soul back into his body so that he could come back to life? The soul departs, and the soul, in this case, came back and brought the life back. The soul is a separate entity that is part of us. Now, in the New World Translation, and, and this is, I don't know, I, I'm kind of a nerd about this, but it's really interesting to see their manipulation and their subtlety and their changes throughout time. I looked up because they have their New World Translation available on the internet. And, I, you know, this I sourced directly from JW.org, their own website. Their own publication, what they're putting out is what they believe. They have the 1984 edition available to view, thankfully, because I don't own any of this stuff. And they also have a 2013 revision. 2013, what, what's happened, uh, you know, ultimately what's happened is that enough people since 1984 have been pointing out all of their errors and all their flaws and how this is just completely ridiculous and how this translation doesn't work, so they have to keep changing it and modifying it to stem off some of these attacks while still trying to retain their false doctrine. So the 1984 version, there's a, when it has soul, with a, it has a little asterisk there, a little footnote. And it says there that the soul is just life. So when it says when his soul returned to him, it was just his life came back. Well, that's not what they believed the soul was when Adam was made a living soul, because this means a person is a soul. Well, now the soul is your life. That it's just, it's just, it just represents life. And, and again, in a way that it's partially true, but that's not all the soul is. It's not just, it's not just life. It's a, it's a being. It's an entity. And um, then in the 2013 edition, they change it, because in the 1984 edition, it still said in this 1 Kings 17 that I quoted for you, it said that his soul came back to him, but 2013, it just says his life came back to him. And then they have an asterisk that says, or soul, as the footnote, right? So they, they went from the more proper rendition of, of you know, the, not the more proper, the, the right rendition of it being a soul, with their little footnote trying to confuse people, saying this really means life. And they swapped them out to say, well, his life came back. Well, that's not what the, the, the Hebrew says. It doesn't say life. It says soul. 
They're two different words. So they've just completely changed it to fit their doctrine and to not cause people to be confused by thinking, well, wait a minute, it says their soul departed from them. So how can that be, you know, so they changed it to say, well, his life departed from him. So that there isn't confusion. So that when people then go to, to challenge them on this, about this concept of a soul, oh, well, in the 2013 edition, it's not, you know, that's not what it says at all. My Bible just says life. It makes it easier for them not to, not to realize these things. Psalm 16, very, very important prophecy here. Verse number 9, the Bible says, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. In the 1984 version, it says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, you will not allow your loyal one to see the pit. So there, they use the word soul. Now, obviously, this is a, this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2. It references back to that and it says explicitly, this is talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, um, I don't even know if I mentioned this, but when I'm going through these, these versions, 1984 versus 2013, it's a New World Translation, which they translated, well, they didn't translate, they just corrupted God's word. And um, what's interesting about this is they won't tell you who the translators were. It came from the watchtower, so it's coming from God. So these prophets were just, you know, inspired by God to, to give you this, this thing. Now, any Bible translation that's out there today, I think, other than this one, they'll tell you who the people are that worked on their translation. They're not hiding it. And the reason is so that you can look back and say, what are the, like, like does this person even know the language? What, what, what do they have? What kind of knowledge do they have to, to be an authority of saying, this is what the Bible means in Greek? You know, I'm translating this from Hebrew or Greek to English. Who translated it? Oh, we're not going to tell you that. It just came from our scholars within the Watchtower Society. And there are testimonies of people, again, out there that I've seen, where that were used to be involved in the high levels of the of Jehovah's Witnesses organization in the Watchtower, and they said, yeah, these people had very, very, very little knowledge of these original languages that, that were involved in the translation process. Because the whole purpose of them putting out their own Bible was to promote their own false doctrines because it's so far removed from scripture and from good doctrine that you, ha you cannot use a regular Bible to, to, to show what they're trying to show is the truth because it's completely contradictory. So their 1984 version said, you know, again, it wasn't quite as corrupt. They made a lot of corruptions, but it wasn't still quite as corruption because they still left the word soul in there for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Now they don't use the word hell because they use Sheol and Hades and Gehenna and they want to use these terms in the original, you know, so they just transliterate which means they don't translate what the word actually meant. They just keep the same word in a foreign language to cause confusion. Because we don't use the word shield. We don't use the word Hades. We don't use the word Gehenna. Now, the King James translators knew what those words meant in those languages, and they translated it as hell. Because we, as English-speaking people, know what hell means. It's not a hard word to understand. I mean... There may be some real subtle differences between what people believe hell is, but it's a pretty simple concept. You, you say a hell to someone, you're going to be thinking of fire, burning, torture. I mean, that's real common. So they say, you will not leave my soul in shield. And then when you click on their little notes, their footnotes, they actually say in Latin, inferno. Huh, inferno, what does that sound like? Or in Spanish, el infierno. It's a fire. Well, I was surprised they even had that in their, in their footnote in the 1984 version because you could look at that and say, wow, that looks like fire to me. But the 2013, nope, they change it. They say, for you will not leave me in the grave. So now they've changed Sheol to the grave. You will not allow your loyal one to see the pit, which is funny because the second part of that verse, they didn't change it all. They left that untouched. It was just that first part, just the one dealing with the soul. And notice, it says, you will not leave me in the grave. Not my soul, you will not leave me in the grave. So they changed soul to me, and they changed Sheol to the grave. Just completely changing the meaning of the verse 
to conform to their man-made doctrine. Now, their glossary term for the grave, because they use this in the 2013 version a lot, says when lowercase, it refers to an individual grave. When capitalized, which is the case in this verse, uh, the common grave of mankind. That's what they say the grave means. It's just the common grave of man. Just mankind in general dies and goes to the grave. That's what they say this word sheol means. That it's just the common grave. I mean, every man goes to the grave. Every man dies. The equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol and the Greek Hades, and see, they, they, they prey on people's weaknesses and their ignorance of you know, what these words really mean. Most people don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew, which I don't know very much about them either, but they just say, like, well, see, you don't know this, so we're just going to tell you that that's what these words mean. That this just means the grave. It is described in the Bible as a symbolic place or condition wherein all activity and consciousness cease. That's, just, that's, just, that's what the way the Bible says it is, and this is the way it is, so just believe us. Psalm 19.7 says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Again, we're talking about their definition of a soul. And what they say it is. They said it's the life. They say it's a body. You know, man became a soul. Um, here, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Our souls need to be converted. We need to be saved, Right? Uh, their 1984 version says the law of Jehovah is perfect, bringing back the soul. And then in 2013, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring strength. So now a soul has been replaced with just restoring strength. So now the soul is strength or a lack of strength or, you know, a fully restored. What does it mean? They're not consistent at all with their definition. They just change it to try to fit their doctrines. That's why I'm bringing all this stuff up. And these are good examples and things to be aware of, too, that, you know, with these revisions, you want to show someone something. So sometimes I'll try to show people, hey, look in your Bible here, because I know a few places for this very purpose to try to show people that there's contradictions and problems. And now in their newer versions, it's, they're trying to make it harder for believers to show people the errors of their ways because it's just so far removed. And um, then that forces you to try to get into some argument about the original languages, which most people don't know anything about at all. So now you're trying to tell them, well, that's not what it says in the Greek and Hebrew. And they're, oh, well, do you speak Hebrew? No, I don't. But that's not what it says. You know, and you get into that, which is going to end up being unfruitful completely. Um, Matthew 10, 28, just to support our view of a soul being separate. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Again, a distinction between killing the body versus killing the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Um, two separate things. And then in Acts 2, man, I am so far behind on time. Yeah, we're just going to make this a two-parter. <laughs> I'm calling it right now. We're going to make this a two-parter. So we'll go to this. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 2 because this is important for you to see also. Acts chapter 2. This was the, um, the New Testament showing the fulfillments of what we read in Psalm 16. All important doctrine. See, by looking at and, and trying to understand a little bit about what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, it, it reinforces what we believe in good doctrine is from the Bible. We believe that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell after he died on the cross. He didn't go to heaven. He didn't go to a nice place in the middle of the earth. He went to hell. Jesus Christ bare the sins of the whole world in his own body on the tree. And he paid for those sins when he died on the cross and his soul descended into the heart of the earth, into hell. Which is, by the way, the punishment for our sins. And again, I'm going to get into that more tonight about hell. But Acts chapter 2 very clearly and distinctly teaches this to us, that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell, not his body, Jesus wasn't made a living soul in the sense that his body was alive on this earth. No, his soul departed from his body and went to hell. Acts 2, look at verse 27. The Bible says, and this is the quote from Psalm 16, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. 
Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now, the reason why he makes that statement is because he's talking about David. David is the author of that psalm. He's the one that wrote it down. So he's explaining that, look, this wasn't David speaking of himself about his own soul being left in hell. He says, you know, patriarch David, he's dead. He's buried. His sepulcher is still here, right? So he's not talking about his body not seeing corruption. David's body did corrupt. It was put in the grave. His sepulcher is still here. It's got his remains in there to this day. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 30, now he says, Therefore, being a prophet, now he's going to give the understanding of this, of this passage. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And this is a true, the sign of a true prophet of God, because what he spake actually came to pass. What he spake in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 16, about Jesus Christ's soul um, not being left in hell, actually happened at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It came to pass. It was of God. He was able to see this beforehand because he had the knowledge from God and it literally happened. That's why we believe it. Because it's of God. Now, for this whole passage, I'm just going to point out what the New World Translation will say at this point. Because this is a very critical passage. I mean, for understanding even the gospel. Understanding who Jesus is, what he did for us. This is, this is a very important passage. Their 1984 version says, Because you will not leave my soul in Hades, neither will you allow your loyal one to see corruption. You have made life's ways known to me. You will fill me with good cheer with your face. Men, brothers, it is allowable to speak with freeness of speech to you concerning the family head David, that he both deceased and was buried, and his tomb is among us to this day. Therefore, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, that he would seat one from the fruitage of his loins upon his throne, he saw beforehand and spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he forsaken in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So now again, they use that word Hades. It doesn't say a hell, but they want to you know, already get people saying, well, what's Hades? I don't know what Hades is. And notice, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to read these things too. Like how, I don't know how anyone can read this and say this is the word of God. I think they make it confusing on purpose and just the, the grammar is not right and it just sounds silly because it's just more confusing than anything and that's why they want you to read this and say, oh, I can't understand what this is saying. Yeah, because it's not written in very good English at all and it's confusing the way it's written and they want you confused so that they can be the ones that bring you the truth. The 2013 edition, though, it says, you will not leave my soul in Hades, they change it to because you will not leave me in the grave. So now they've changed it even from Hades, which still is accurate in the sense that that's what the Greek word says. It uses the word Hades. It's translated as hell in English for us because we understand what hell is. But Hades, even if you understand Greek mythology, you'll understand that Hades is not just the grave. It's not just a tomb. It's actually a place like an underworld where people go, their souls go after they die. Now, it, I'm not saying that the Greek mythological place of Hades is exactly the way that hell is. But to say that, well, that really just means the grave is ludicrous. Because that's not what it means. They've just completely given false information and, just, and it's just completely inaccurate. It's not true. It's a lie. So they say, you will not leave me in the grave, nor will you allow your loyal one to see corruption. And again, it goes on with like the same um, words as the 1984 version. And then it says, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn him with an oath that he would seat one of his offspring on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that neither was he forsaken in the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. Which doesn't make any sense because it says neither nor. Neither was he forsaken in the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. But it's like they're talking about the same thing in what they're talking about, the grave. Well, where was his flesh? In the grave. So why would you use a neither nor as in not this, nor this? 
Because what it's talking about is two separate things. It's talking about his soul going to one place and his body being in a tomb. But here they just, I mean, and people just read right over, just, just you know, dig into it. It doesn't make any sense because they're trying to promote a false doctrine. Um, and the last verse I have here is in regards to what we believe about a soul being separate from the body and not just being, uh, you know, quote unquote, life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it gives three distinct parts of, of what makes us a body, soul, and spirit. All in one verse, very clearly laid out. Now I'm going to get into, and we're, we're just going to continue the rest of this tonight, so don't worry, I'm not going to just go uh, way, way, way over time with my multiple pages of more notes here. Um, but the last one I want to cover, because this is still related somewhat, and this is going to be related, related to my other sermon too on hell, but um, blood transfusions. They don't allow for blood transfusions. Turn, if you would, to Well, no, I'll, I'm just going to read this for you because there's one other, one other thing I'll get to. We're gonna blood transfusions and then turn if you would to Daniel chapter 10. We'll get there in just a minute. So they take the, 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 the law of the Old Testament that says that we're not supposed to eat blood. And that's what the Bible says. It's very clear. It's talking about when you kill an animal to, you know, to eat, to consume, you eat their meat, but you're not supposed to be drinking their blood. Now, the Bible uses the word eat. Same thing for drinking. It's just consuming it. Um, that is what the law said. Now, getting a blood transfusion, you are not ingesting any blood. You're literally just supplying the blood that's currently circulating through your system with, with other blood. And usually it's used for surgeries and things like that to help keep you alive. The Bible says that the, the life of the the, the the life of the body is found in the blood. And I, and I, again, I'm, I'm misquoting that, but um, that the blood is the life thereof. And I got this from JW.org. Again, went straight to the source on their explanation about blood transfusions. And here's what they say. The Bible commands that we not ingest blood. That statement is true, what they just said. Now they go on and say, so we should not accept whole blood or its primary components in any form whether offered as food or as a transfusion, note the following scriptures. Now they're trying to say, see, this is why we shouldn't take it in any form and because of these scriptures. And they quote Genesis 9-4. They say, God allowed Noah and his family to add animal flesh to their diet after the flood, but commanded them not to eat the blood. Again, that statement's correct. After the flood, God said, okay, now you, because before that they were on more of a vegetarian diet. Now he's saying, okay, you could eat whatever animal you want to eat but you cannot eat the blood. And then it said, they say here that God told Noah, Noah, only flesh with its soul, its blood, you must not eat. This command applies to all mankind from that time on because all are descendants of Noah. So, and yeah, it's not easy to, to even, like, What? Genesis 9, 4 in the Bible says, but, the fle but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Right? It says that the blood is the life. Remember before when we were going over the soul, they said the soul was the life? Well, that's why now they're saying the soul is the blood. Because the blood is the life. That they're all the same thing, which is why they, they quote Genesis 9, 4 saying, only flesh with its soul dash, it's blood, dash. So this is an equivocal statement saying, oh, you don't understand what the soul is? I'm talking about the blood. So what does the soul mean to Jehovah's Witnesses? What is the soul? Is it blood? Is it life? Is it the flesh? When God breathed into Adam, did he breathe blood into his veins? I mean, this is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. But see, understanding this concept and the reason why they don't want to even believe that there is a soul is because they reject the notion of there being a hell and eternal judgment or punishment. They just want to think that you're either annihilated or you're still as a human being with flesh on this earth, and that's it, and those are the options. So they need to go to great lengths 
to try to tell you that a soul is not distinct from the body. So they, they just, you know, in whatever serves their purpose. So in this, because soul is mentioned a lot of times in the Bible. The word soul is used a lot in the Bible. I mean, hundreds of times. So they need to, you know, they try to, to catch all of them. And here they just call the soul the blood. Leviticus 17, 14 is another place they reference as to why to not get a transfusion. Now, this has nothing to do with transfusion. It's talking about eating. Eating it. Literally, I mean, eating it. Leviticus 17, 14, they quote to saying, you must not eat the blood of any sort of flesh because the soul of every sort of flesh is its blood. The soul of every sort of flesh is its blood. There, they just, again, they said that the soul is the blood. So would that mean if you get a blood transfusion, you're getting someone else's soul? I mean, this is weird. It's just a bizarre doctrine. It's a strange doctrine. Again, another sign of a cult when you just come up, when people just come up with strange, weird doctrines that don't even make sense, you're probably in a cult. It says, anyone eating it will be cut off. God viewed the soul, and then they say, or life, as being in the blood and belonging to him. So now they're explaining this. They're explaining their own verse by saying the soul is the life that is in the blood. But the verse it is quoted says it is the blood. The soul is the blood. And this is their own explanation on their website. That although this law was given only to the nation of Israel, it shows how seriously God viewed the law against eating blood. The, the New World Translation 1984 edition says, for the soul of every sort of flesh is its blood by the soul in it. That, ver that, that confuse, if you're confused, it confuses me. The soul of every sort of flesh is its blood by the soul in it. The soul is the blood by the soul. But supposedly this is God's word. And then Acts 15, 20, uh, they, they give another reference here. Abstain from blood. God gave Christians the same command that he had given to Noah. History shows that early Christians refused to consume whole blood or even to use it for medical reasons. Well, they just made that up. Or even to use it for medical reasons. That's not found in the Bible anywhere. It just says not to eat it. And this is, th this is what they had. This is their explanation from them. I'm not leaving anything out. I, I don't even have to try to show, you know, like they just make a claim and don't support it whatsoever. And, you know, this should go, whether it's Jehovah's Witness or anybody, anyone making a claim about the Bible, be aware of that and make sure that you're able to prove all things. The Bible says hold fast to that, which is good. Whether I'm saying it or anyone else at all is saying it, it could be your you know, a family member, a friend, if anyone's going to make a claim on the Bible, make sure that they could defend that claim or make sure you could defend that claim, you know, that it's actually found in Scripture because this is our source of what is true and what is not true. And you can't just listen to what someone else says because they try to say it with authority or whatever. Now, the verses that I just read um, about the soul and the blood and all this other stuff, they were changed in the 2013 revision back to life instead of soul. So they're trying to now cover up this stuff, this nonsense of saying the soul is the blood. They just change the word soul to life, but then they still open up themselves and say, well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the underlying manuscripts say in the other language. It's not it. They just, but they don't care about what they say because it's not honest because they don't care about the truth. They just care about their religion. And then they'll have the asterisk that says, or soul. Right? They still don't eliminate it completely. They just, they just throw all this extra confusion in there. Now, I'm going to stop there. I know I had you turn to another place. We're going to stop there because the next point is pretty big. They don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Very, 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 very important. Extremely important. I mean, this is critical to your own salvation. Because if you don't have the right Jesus that you're believing on, you're not saved. People could come up with all kinds of different Jesuses. You could, you could build a, a, an idol and say, this is Jesus. And if someone says, well, I'm believing on Jesus and they're talking about some idol, they're not saved because that's not the Jesus you need to believe in. And if you say you believe in Jesus, who is Michael the archangel, because that's what they really believe, as ludicrous as that sounds, they believe that Jesus Christ is Michael the archangel, that that's the same person, 
That Michael the Archangel was in heaven, then came down to this earth and became Jesus Christ, and then when Jesus Christ left, now he's Michael the Archangel again. That's what they believe and teach. They don't have the right Jesus. That's why we need to bring the right Jesus to them, and we want to do it in love. We don't want to be mocking and scorning of them when we try to win, you know, bring the gospel to them. But keep in mind some of these things so that you don't, you know, because their terms are so different that you're aware of them. And if, you're, if someone's willing to listen to you and you give them the gospel, but they're still not getting it, get into some of these things and challenge them on it. Try to get them to challenge what they're being told by the watchtower. Get them to at least say, hey, do you know anything about the history? Do you know really that much about Charles Taze Russell or about Rutherford? Do you know about all the changes that were made? Does that bother you at all that these men claim to be men of God and they're not because the prophecies didn't come true? Does that matter to you? Do you have a sincere desire to know what truth is and to know who Jehovah is? Is that sincere for you or are you just willing to be blind and do and believe and think whatever someone else tells you? That's the way we need to approach these people is just, you know, again, with humility, with grace, but with truth. We're going to be the most effective the more knowledge that you have. Start with the gospel. They need, everybody needs the gospel. God didn't give us a different plan for different people to be saved. It's the same plan. It's the same truth. But knowing this should be able to help supplement trying to get people to think, especially those that you may, you may know personally, you may have a coworker, you may have a relative that you get more opportunities to speak with. So, you know, take this information. And, you know, it's also good for us to just kind of make sure that we're clear on what our doctrine is and why we believe what we believe because that's where we're going over a lot of this stuff. So come back tonight. We're going to go through the rest of... of this on, uh, on their beliefs, if you want to learn a little bit more about it and, and um, some of the other. And, and I'm only choosing, and there's so many things we could preach, I could preach from, but I'm choosing like the most important critical things that, that I think are just so grievous and serious that they need to be handled and dealt with. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your clear words. God, I pray that you would please help us all to have a a humble heart, a humble spirit when we talk to people and, and try to, to lead people to Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would please also um, you know, help us to, to have more knowledge and wisdom and be able to, to show people the errors. God, help us to also be on guard against false doctrines and against just teachings of man that's not coming from you. God, um, help us to be diligent to search the scriptures for ourselves, to know what your word says, to know what we believe and why we believe it based on the things that are written in your words. And um, Lord, we love you and we thank you for the, for the guidance that you provide to us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.